good evening. Uh, welcome to this Cato Institute evening forum uh, entitled Hayekian Behavioral Economics and Oxymora. My name is Ryan Bourne. I'm the author of the recently released Cato book Economics in One Virus, but more pertinently for this session, I occupy the R. Evan Shaft Chair for the Public Understanding of Economics here at Cato. We've got a really stellar pal uh, panel for you this evening to discuss what on the face of it uh, might sound like a high level theoretical debate on terms, but I assure you at its core, it's one that really touches on fundamental issues about the limits and desirability of government action, when government should intervene, how and what the consequences of those interventions uh, would be. Friedrich Hayek's work, of course, made the case for individual freedom of choice, in part because third parties or planners tend to lack the localized or tacit knowledge that individuals hold that go a long way towards uh, informing our, our preferences and our subsequent actions. Interferences with evolved market practices and personal freedom, he thought, would therefore tend to fail and often make choosers worse off. Over the past decade or so, however, many behavioral economics, uh, economists sorry, have contended that choosers are prone to certain biases, such that our private decisions may in fact result in people being unable to fulfill their true preferences or else causing immense harm to them. If that indeed is the case, the question then becomes what can be done about it, given the evident limits and distortions caused by many top-down interventions by planners. So to discuss whether the broad claims of behavioral ec economists are true and whether there are approaches to dealing with them, uh, dealing with the, the subsequent issues that are consistent with acknowledging uh, the kind of Hayekian knowledge problem I outlined, we're really de delighted tonight to be joined by Professor Cass Sunstein, uh, the Robert Walmsley University Professor at Harvard. From 2009 to 2012, he was administrator uh, of the uh, White House Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs. He is the founder and director of the Program on Behavioral Economics and Public Policy at Harvard Law School. Uh, he's currently doing some work for the, the Biden administration, which he may well tell you about. And he's the author of the paper Hayekian Behavioral Economics, upon which uh, the title of this event is based. I'm also really delighted to be joined by Professor Mario Rizzo, Professor of Economics at New York University and the co-director of the Classical Liberal Institute at NYU Law School. Professor Rizzo is the co-author with Glenn Whitman of the book Escaping Paternalism, Rationality, Behavioral Economics and Public Policy, and is currently writing a response to the Hayekian Behavioral Economics piece, uh, which I believe is to be published in the journal Behavioral Public Policy. Last, but by no means least, we welcome Professor Keith, uh, Kip Vescusi, University Distinguished Professor of Law, Economics and Management at Vanderbilt Law School. Professor Vescusi has no doubt been in demand a lot this year as researchers have sought to assess the costs and benefits of uh, various lockdown measures, given he's the world expert on the value of mitigating death risks, the so-called value of a statistical life, but he has also written extensively across a whole host of economic issues, including behavioral economics and some of the biases that afflict government action too. The way that this um, event will work is that Professor Sunstein will speak for about 20 minutes to kick us off. Uh, uh, then Professor Rizzo, Professor Vescusi will each have 10 minutes to respond before we branch out into a general moderated discussion. Um, in that discussion, I hope that as many of you can contribute as possible with pertinent questions. You can submit them on a whole host of different platforms this evening. Uh, Cato's site, uh, YouTube, Twitter, uh, Facebook, and I'm sure there are several others that I'm missing, but have no fear if you submit your question by any of those platforms, it will come through a central system to me and um, I'll try to include and incorporate as many as possible. If you are following the event online on Twitter, you can use the hashtag CatoEcon to keep up with what other people are saying. So with that, I'll, I'll stop talking and I'll pro uh, pass over to Professor Cass Sunstein. Thanks for being with us and I hope you enjoy the event. Thank you so much. It's uh, an honor and also a lot of fun to be able to discuss this. I'm very grateful to Cato uh, for extraordinary work over the years and also to Professors Rizzo and Viscuzzi from whom I've learned so much and from whom I continue to learn so much. 
so this uh, set of remarks is going to be based on um, uh, a, 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 an act of curiosity. That is for decades, Hayek has been a hero of mine. Uh, behavioral economics and its findings have been a focus of mine for fewer decades than my admiration for Hayek, but for decades. And the question is whether there is such a thing as Hayekian behavioral economics. I'm going to suggest that there is in the sense that we can take on board uh, with enthusiasm Hayek's notations about the fallibility of planners and the epistemic uh, problems planners of all sorts face, while also recognizing that human beings in choice making are sometimes insufficiently informed, something that I think would not baffle Hayek in the least, and also sometimes behaviorally biased. Uh, the hero of the piece is going to be thinking of what choosers choose under epistemically favorable conditions, that is conditions under which choosers are free or free enough from information gaps and from behavioral biases. So Hayekian behavioral economics at its core is not going to ask what do planners know and believe and prefer, but going to, is going to ask what do choosers know and believe and prefer under circumstances that are epistemically favorable. As a reminder and for kind of shared background, Hayek's distinctive account of the reason to respect liberty is rooted in his critique of socialism and centralized planning. His emphasis was on the uh, uh, lack of knowledge on the part of planners compared with the knowledge that participants in markets have. The basic objection sketched in his uh, great short 1945 essay on the use of knowledge in society is that the price system is a marvel because it aggregates the information and tastes of lots of people, incorporating a lot more information than could possibly be assembled by central planners or groups or boards. Hayek emphasized the unshared nature of information, the dispersed bits of incomplete and frequently contradictory knowledge which all the separate individuals possess. He stressed the very important but unorganized knowledge which cannot possibly be called scientific in the sense of general rules, the knowledge of particular circumstances of time and place. Hayek was not an emotional writer, but there's a, a sense of soaring at least in his suggestion that it is more than a metaphor to describe the price system as a kind of machinery for registering changes or a system of telecommunications which enables individual producers to watch merely the movement of a few pointers. This was what Hayek described as a marvel a word which he chose, he says, on purpose, so as to shock the reader out of the complacency with which we often take the working of the mechanism for granted. So on Hayek's account, the price system is uh, an extraordinary device for capturing collective intelligence, in part because it collects in everyone what everyone knows, and in part because it imposes the right incentives. Okay, that's the background. In light of modern behavioral findings about human error, it would be possible to object that the price system is not always so marvelous and that other institutions might do better. If consumers show limited attention, they don't pay attention to certain characteristics of products, let's say, or activities. If they show unrealistic optimism, if they are, uh, uh, more indifferent than they ought to be to risks that they face because they think they have a personal immunity against those risks, or if they suffer or maybe benefit from present bias in the sense that they have um, implausibly high discount rates, the price system might miss something important and the system of telecommunications might give the wrong messages. It would also be possible to agree with Hayek's arguments about planning and prices while also thinking that certain forms of regulation alert to behavioral biases are not out of bounds. 
Hayek himself did not engage with behavioral findings for reasons that we can discuss. Some of them are temporal, but he did engage with the limitations of, uh, of private markets. So Hayek wrote, probably nothing has done as much harm to the liberal cause as the wooden insistence of some liberals on some rule, rough rules of thumb, above all the principle of laissez-faire. Hayek didn't choose his words carelessly, so we might pause over that provocative sentence. Or consider this, to prohibit the use of certain poisonous substances or to require certain precautions in their use, to limit working hours or to require certain sanitary arrangements is fully compatible with the preservation of competition. The only question here is whether in the particular instance, the advantages gained are greater than the social costs that they impose. I'm thinking of Professor Viscuzzi here, who's emphasized precisely that question, the question whether the advantages gained are greater than the social costs. And Hayek was in this passage, at, the, at least on board the cost-benefit train, even in a case in which externalities are not self-evidently involved. In fact, limitation of working hours or requirement of certain sanitary arrangements doesn't seem offhand to be a problem of externalities. Maybe a mandatory seatbelt law, a ban on trans fats, or regulation of exposure to certain carcinogens in the workplace would be unobjectionable if the only question here, according to Hayek, is answered favorably to the initiative. So the question remains, do Hayek's arguments count against cigarette taxes or taxes on sugar-sweetened beverages? Are they a large-scale objection to paternalism from public institutions? Hayek didn't answer these questions, his high level concerns about coercion and about the deficiencies of planners can't answer concrete questions such as whether salient disclosure requirements are essential to overcome limited attention or whether energy efficiency mandates are an appropriate response to present bias and myopic loss aversion. Those just aren't questions he answered. Now, I have to make a methodological point here as I switch to Hayekian behavioral economics. In saying what Hayek would have thought about behavioral findings, I think our enterprise is interpretive in Ronald Dworkin's sense. That is, there isn't a fact of the matter in the sense of a passage or an essay from Hayek that says, here's what I think about behavioral findings insofar as they are invoked in context where we're thinking about government regulation. Dworkin's conception of interpretation was interpretation owes a duty of fidelity to a text. And in cases in which fidelity pushes in, uh, authorizes two or more interpretations, we have to put the materials in the best constructive light. So in thinking what Kant would have thought about attacks on sugar-sweetened beverages, or what Aristotle would have thought about a mandatory seatbelt law, or how Mill would have approached fuel economy standards for automobiles, we're not merely owed a duty of fidelity to text, but we also have to think what casts those uh, great thinkers' views in the best constructive light. And I'm going to be trying to do that here, not urging that there is a text of Hayek's that uniquely leads to this conception of behavioral economics, but suggesting that this is faithful to Hayek and that it fit, puts his concerns and deepest claims in a favorable light. Okay, any form of Hayekian behavioral economics would firmly reject the view that public officials should be content to identify individual errors and to declare victory. We have to ask on Hayekian grounds, how costly are the errors compared with the errors that would be induced by corrective measures? To engage in that analysis, we have to know something about relative institutions. What I'm suggesting, if we do decide to proceed with a remedy, a Hayekian approach would try to reduce the knowledge problem by asking what individuals do under epistemically favorable conditions. So that's the cavalry uh, in the context of a problem for which we need a cavalry. The good news is a stream of research is asking exactly that question. What do choosers in fact choose under epistemically favorable conditions? not what do planners want given the, their own values and desires and commitments.
In practice, the question of what can be chose, what do choosers choose under epistemically favorable conditions can be disciplined by asking five not that complicated questions. First, what do informed choosers choose? With respect to X or Y or Z, if we have a category of people who have information, what do they choose? That might be relevant to policymaking. We might ask, what do active choosers choose? What do people who actually make a choice rather than people who sit on their hands end up doing? The reason that's relevant is active choosers, if we focus on them, that protects our, us against the possibility that outcomes are a product of inertia or procrastination. We might ask third, in circumstances in which people are free of relevant biases, such as say present bias or unrealistic optimism, what do they choose? That would be a relevant question to ask what do people choose under epistemically favorable conditions. Fourth, what do consistent choosers, unaffected by clearly irrelevant factors, such as framing effects, what do they end up doing? That would also tell us something about what free persons, unaffected by, let's just stipulate, a self-evidently irrelevant factor, what do they do? And fifth and finally, what do people choose when their view screen is broad and they're not suffering from limited attention? If the people are buying a product that has eight characteristics, when we know that they're thinking about eight, what do they do? As opposed to what do people do when we know that population is choosing, is, is thinking about three and not the five others. It's possible, of course, that they're thinking about three because that's all they care about. That is a possible empirical fact, but it's not a necessary fact. It would be an empirical fact. Okay, so the best approach I'm suggesting is to ask what are active informed choosers who are free of behavioral biases, who have broad view screens, who are unaffected by clearly irrelevant factors and frames, what do they do? Now, this might seem like an abstract question for which one ought to, uh, on Hayekian grounds, be most distrustful of those who even dare to ask such questions. But before you get there, let's just notice there's a stream of research that's asking exactly these questions. Hunt Alcott, for example, has explored the question, what do consumers who are actually informed about fuel efficiency of vehicles in such a way that they know what they're doing, what do they end up choosing? That would tell us something about how to think about choices in the market. It might tell us everything's fine. It might tell us, Houston, we have a bit of a problem. Should employers offer opt-in savings plans or opt-out savings plans? If we know that many employees are affected by the frame, that is whether they end up in savings plans depends on whether it's opt-in or opt-out, then we might think inconsistent choosers, their own preferences are hard to discern. But suppose that many others are unaffected by the frame. They choose consistently. Doesn't matter whether they typically opt in or typically out, topped out. If the consistent choosers typically go one way, and if they are not demographically or in other terms different from the inconsistent choosers, the fact that the consistent choosers go one way tells us something. Suppose that we know that active choosers choose to enroll in certain programs. Once they make a choice, they say that one's for me. If so, there's at least some reason to think those programs are in consumers' interests. If most consumers do not enroll in such programs when active choosing is not promoted, we have reason to think that their failure to do so might be a product of inertia or inattention. It's not decisive. They might be a different population, but at least we have a reason. We could have experiments that make the potential economic savings of, let's say, energy efficiency appliances, energy efficient appliances, highly salient, at least potentially overcoming present bias and limited attention. What do choosers do in those circumstances? If they choose to or not to choose energy efficient appliances in such circumstances, we've learned something about what is likely to increase their welfare. Not everything, but something. 
I've emphasized there might be heterogeneity in the relevant population, making it challenging to generalize from what some part, some part of, a popu of the population does. But let's just suppose, to get analysis off the ground, that there's no such heterogeneity. In principle and sometimes in practice, efforts to answer the subsidiary questions should help private and public institutions with welfare analysis where it's often challenging to know how to proceed when behavioral findings seem to cast doubt on standard uses of revealed preferences. I don't want to talk here about latent preferences or real preferences. I don't want to use words like that. They're too uh, obscurantist. All we want to say is if someone gets lost because they don't have a GPS device and they en end up, let's say, in Colorado when they really want to be um, in DC, if they get lost with the GPS without a GPS device, and with a GPS device they end up in DC, which is that where they want, we have reason to think the GPS is actually helping them, which suggests that under epistemically favorable conditions, those in which a GPS is there and helping people to get to their preferred destination, we are knowledgeable that that particular behaviorally informed intervention, that is the GPS device, is likely to be in their interests. The basic point is that efforts to answer the subsidiary questions, which have admittedly have been compressed, are intended to help private and public planners, where I guess our spotlight is on public planners, act in a way that builds on the choices of the reliable choosers rather than on the uh, judgments of planners themselves operating in an epistemic vacuum. Can an approach be adopted, this is the large question, that might fairly claim to be Hayekian? In view of skepticism on the part of Hayek himself and modern day Hayekians about top-down expertise, the answer isn't self-evident. But let me suggest that we ought to be aware of two things, which Hayek himself was not vulnerable, but I think some uh, of his contemporary followers might be. The first is what Matthew Rabin calls explainations, which is an effort to find a behavioral um, bias and then to say, well, there is an unbiased explanation that can account for it and they de then declare victory. In that case, explainations in uh, Rabin's telling are operating as what an old law professor used to call one step ahead of the sheriff arguments that is clever and uh, somewhat desperate efforts to rescue um, a, a thesis or a framework from a, an apparent blow. Uh, the rescue attempt might be successful, but it's a testable hypothesis at, at best. It might, it might not even be good enough to be that, but it's a testable hypothesis, not a, uh, a decisive blow. So beware, I suggest, of explanations. Also beware of the use of tacit knowledge as a kind of modern day phlogiston. That is a force or something that can be invoked as a way of uh, explaining a phenomenon which is very different, difficult otherwise to explain. Tacit knowledge might be at work in explaining why people get lost or lose money or lose years of their life, but, but maybe not. Okay, the basic idea is in the first instance and probably in the last, behaviorally informed policy should be based not on the preferences and values of social planners, but on learning from the choices of informed and unbiased choosers. It might be, it might be possible to identify the choices. If we can, we're on a good road, which is toward identifying appropriate interventions whether they involve nudges, taxes, subsidies, or mandates. It would be extravagant, maybe, to claim that those interventions defended by reference to people's choices under epistemically favorable conditions are Hayekian exclamation point. That might be extravagant. But it may not be extravagant to insist that they're in Hayek's general spirit and respective, respectful of his most fundamental concerns. They might, if we're lucky, provide an orientation for both theory and practice, now in its early stages, 
that promises to preserve and to cherish freedom while also improving human lives, not least by lengthening them. Thank you. Well, great. Thank you so much for that. And perfectly on time as well, which I always uh, like to see. So, Professor Rizzo, I'll hand over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, I first of all want to thank everyone for making this discussion possible. I think it's going to be quite interesting. It's already quite interesting. Uh, I don't like to uh, add, however, that my full response, I have 10 minutes, uh, will appear in behavioral public policy along with uh, Cass's article. Uh, I don't intend to spend much time on whether Hayek would have approved a behavioral public policy. Uh, however, as many of you know, uh, May 8th was Hayek's uh, 122nd birthday. He's quite old right now. And in my birthday seance with him, I asked whether he approved of behavioral public policy. And he said simply that he didn't much care for it. And that is all he had to say. Well, that's not quite enough. So what I will do here is answer the question, has behavioral public policy solved the Hayekian knowledge problem? So let me uh, just review a few things uh, to start. And in this, I think Cass and, and I are in perfect agreement. First of all, behavioral public policy is not just one thing. Uh, I view it as a combination of three things. First, uh, a set of normative standards. Um, and these range from true preferences, which was a term previously used, to direct welfare uh, measurement. Secondly, it's a continuum of policies from soft to hard, advice, nudges, non-waivable, default syntaxes, mandates. And thirdly, it claims to be evidence-based. That means no a priori assumptions about individual uh, behavior. So what is the Hayekian knowledge problem? I think Cass uh, correctly identified it. Uh, we have to contrast uh, general scientific knowledge, propositions, rules derived from science with the concrete knowledge of the circumstances of time and place. For example, certain biases may be found in lab experiments. However, in the real world, the instantiation of these is heavily context dependent, both as to existence and quantitative magnitude. Even where present, the effects are context dependent. Now, there was a, there is a uh, economist, excuse me, a uh, psychologist who is generally recognized as one of the leading psychologists of the 20th century, Jerome Kagan. I think he's emeritus at Harvard. Uh, in a book called uh, Psychology's Ghosts, Kagan emphasizes what he considers to be a fundamental problem of psychology. And this is what he says, quote, Few psychological concepts intended to represent a person's tendency to react in a certain way apply across diverse settings. So this is a recognition, I think, of essentially the Hayekian knowledge problem only in psychology. Uh, we can have generalizations about uh, psychological propensities, but they are very, very context dependent. Okay, so let's go on to the main question is behavioral public policy evidence-based? I'm gonna talk about what I consider to be the seven deadly knowledge problems of behavioral public policy. The first relates to the question of true preferences. Now, what are these? These are essentially counterfactual preferences, preferences that people would have if they had all relevant information, no deficit of cognitive abilities and complete willpower. But this is essentially the picture of the perfect neoclassical agent, which behavioral economists say does not exist. Therefore, the satisfaction of two preferences does not satisfy the preferences of any real living person, even if they can be discovered. This is an interesting result that's not often uh, emphasized, but I'm going to uh, ignore it for the rest of what I have to say, but I think it's an important point. Secondly, there's the question of the degree of bias. Now, it's not enough to know the presence of a bias. We must know its quantitative extent. For example, a properly calibrated syntax must take cognizance of the degree to which people prefer healthier food later rather than now. 
their present bias with respect to food. The weaker the bias, the lower the tax should be and vice versa. But quantitative estimates of bias are unreliable and do not generalize into the real world. Uh, both Colin Camera and Levitt and List have uh, articles uh, demonstrating this. So, yes. So the third one that I want to emphasize is the question of bias interactions. Normally, behavioralists analyze the effect of only one bias at a time. Uh, Wikipedia lists, however, of 175 cognitive biases. Now, in all fairness, not all of these 175 biases are, are that distinct, but nevertheless, there are an awful lot of cognitive biases. But re a recent NBER uh, study shows that biases are very often highly correlated with each other. Since biases do not all move in the same direction or to the same degree, the net effects can cancel or efforts to bias a particular one can make matters worse. For example, a person may be present biased and tend to save, intend to save too little. But if he also exists projection bias, uh, exhibits projection bias that is overestimating his future consumption needs and plans for too long a retirement, the overall effect of the, of the bias of present a uh, present bias is unclear as by the biases move in different directions. Fourth, there's population heterogeneity. Behavioral policies are usually one size fits all, one syntax for all consumers of sugary drinks. But biases are not uniform. In one major study, heterogeneity was substantial. For example, 29% of the sample was present bias, while 33% was future bias with respect to money. With respect to food, that is healthier food now or later, 15% were present bias, 7% were future bias. The rest were unbiased. Counteracting behaviors is my fifth uh, problem. I'll give two examples. First, a tax on sugary soft drinks is a favorite proposal among many behavioral economists. Would it do any good even if consumption were reduced? The most likely substitute are soft drinks with non-caloric uh, sweeteners. But there is no consistent evidence that the substitution does any good from a health perspective. Why? People respond by consuming more calories elsewhere. Example two. Those firms which introduced automatic enrollment in retirement savings programs saw their enrollees offset 40% of the retirement savings with loans and withdrawals after eight years compared to those actively enrolled. Sixth problem is one relating to self-regulation and small group debiasing. We need to know not just the tendencies toward biases, but the operative amount in any given situation. This is affected by, first, self-regulation, which is idiosyncratic and can be hard to identify. Mary eats junk, foods, junk food on weekends. Is she breaking her diet, or is this the glue, the exception, that keeps the diet in place? Secondly, growing research shows that when people make decisions after discussion in small groups, biases are eroded and sometimes disappear entirely. In the real world, this would include family members, friends, colleagues, and other advice givers. The last problem uh, that I want to mention today is the dynamic impact of, uh, on self-regulation. Considerable research shows that regulation by external sources and self-regulation are substitutes. Behavioral public policy is supposed in part to be a remedy for deficient willpower. But when internal or self-control is not exercised, it deteriorates in the long run, even in areas unrelated to the initial external regulation. The loss of self-control and self-regulatory capacity generalizes. So in conclusion, Nothing I say today uh, should be construed as claiming that people do not make mistakes, that they are not sometimes foolish, or that they have perfect willpower. People are fallible. 
But it is one thing to recognize human foibles on a general level, yet another thing to ascertain them in specific instances, given the myriad of local and personal factors that must be considered in decision making. People need good information to make good decisions. The market can provide much of it. In some cases, the government may need to provide it. Providing information is not a nudge. It just boosts our decision-making capacity. We all knew this before behavioral economics. Thank you. Well, thank you very much again. And uh, there's no bias in terms of timekeeping so far. So I'll pass straight over to Professor Viscusi to, to round us up. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Ryan Bourne for inviting me to be part of this terrific panel. Unlike Professor Rizzo, I'm not a Hayekian, although I do know several members of the Southern Economic Association who are Austrian economists. I believe that consumer choices and markets have enormous value, but I also recognize a substantial legi legitimate role for the government, as does Cass Sunstein. Today, I'm going to talk about three topics. The first will be the role of consumer choice for fuel economy regulations. Uh, second, what are we to make of behavioral anomalies? Are these problems that need to be fixed or are we using the wrong frame of reference to assess behavior? Then third, what is the Hayekian role of informational policies? Well, when I, first let me start off with the first topic, which is uh, uh, an article I've written that was in the spirit of Hayek on energy regulations. This is an article with Ted Geyer. The title of the article is Overriding Consumer Preferences with Energy Regulations. And we do a critique of the analysis of the corporate average fuel economy standards. They're widely touted as a greenhouse gas policy. What we found is that 87% of the benefits that are claimed for the regulation are from correcting alleged consumer irrationality of not buying the most fuel efficient cars and light trucks. Only 1% of the benefits are US, US greenhouse gas benefits. There's another 6% of the benefits that are greenhouse gas benefits to the rest of the world, which may or may not count. And there's another 1% of other US environmental benefits. So the lion's share of the benefits is driven by the assumed irrationality on the part of consumers. However, the regulatory impact analysis presents no evidence whatsoever of uh, irrational uh, choices on the part of consumers. Instead, EPA observed, it is a conundrum from an economic perspective that these large fuel savings have not been provided by automakers and purchased by consumers. In my view, it's only a conundrum of fuel economy is the only car attribute of interest. Despite being a well-informed consumer, I irrationally purchased a BMW M3 that gets 20 miles per gallon on the highway and considerably less everywhere else. Attributes other than fuel economy were on my mind. Uh, Cass Sunstein's paper is a welcome effort to continue to examine intertemporal irrationalities. He discusses a Swiss working paper presenting new evidence that people don't fully believe fuel economy ratings information and decisions with long-term consequences are notoriously difficult, whether it's buying a car, choosing a spouse or purchasing a, a house or, pur or purchasing a house. I am sympathetic to these issues having found evidence of hyperbolic discounting in valuing water quality improvements. More research certainly would be helpful in nailing down the extent and consequences of intertemporal irrationality. We should encourage further exploration of systematic decision failures as Cass Sunstein is doing, but we should also recognize that there may be legitimate individual preferences that are in play and that these count as well. Uh, the second topic is what are we to make of behavioral anomalies? So do departures from rational economic models indicate failures in decisions? Or is it that our economic models are not appropriate? Did we get it wrong by setting up these models of rational choice? 
So should we instead be building models in which the behavior we observe is the reference point rather than the economic frameworks that economists use? And the examples I'm gonna draw on here are from my book, <laughs> Pricing Lives, and they're gonna deal with risk, three different risk issues. The first of which is ambiguity aversion. People are generally averse to incur highly uncertain risks. But should we then target government policies to focus on imprecisely understood risks? So should worst case fears be our guide? I advocate using actual risks, not potential worst case scenarios as the guide, but this is not what agencies do. Many agencies focus on worst case scenarios and rely on upper bound risk assessments that distort the actual risk level. Uh, the second behavioral anomaly is the spread between willingness to pay and willingness to accept amounts. People are willing to pay much less for a risk decrease than they need to be compensated for a comparable inc risk increase. So when we are valuing government policies, should we be using the willingness to pay benefit values or the willingness to accept benefit values? I advocate using the willingness to pay values, but there are people out there who advocate the willingness to accept values. Behavioral economists uh, uh, are among those who advocate that. A final, a final aspect of behavioral uh, risk biases uh, pertains to the zero risk premium. People are willing to pay a lot more money to get the risk down to zero as opposed to a comparable risk decrease that doesn't get you down to a zero risk. Now getting a risk to zero is attractive since once the risk is zero, you don't have to worry about the risk anymore. But that effect is mostly due to the fact that people overestimate the risk decrease that takes place when you decrease a small risk, which they tend to overestimate, to zero. So in terms of how I would approach things, I would adopt the rational economic model of informed choice as the reference point, and for policy analyses, use mean risk estimates as the guide. Uh, in terms of Cass Sunstein's presentation, I agree with his five principles uh, that he laid out. Finally, let me talk about informational policies as the ideal Hayekian nudges, although the, they were used long before nudges uh, became coined as a term. Informational policies respect the merits of consumer choice and they enable people to make better decisions. The objective of informational policy should be to promote informed choices and enable people to best promote their welfare. So the task is to provide new information in a credible manner, not to try and necessarily change their behavior. So we should inform people about the actual risk rather than try to persuade them or bludgeon them into submission. So an example of a bludgeoning uh, informational policy would be that of graphic warnings for cigarettes. Some countries have tried it. They're not informational policies. They also don't alter smoking behavior. Uh, there's simply an attempt to make the act of smoking uh, seem unpleasant to the smoker. The more prominent current informational effort that's going on in the United States now is with respect to COVID vaccines. Information, providing information about the efficacy of the vaccines enables people to make good private choices and in some cases provide some awareness of the external benefits to others. Uh, the effectiveness of this effort is impeded in part by misinformation, including that from current and former public officials. However, on balance, uh, the, there's, we've had an excellent performance to date in terms of getting large numbers of people uh, vaccinated. There's not enough vaccinations that will result from information because people will not fully internalize the external benefits to others of their failure to vaccinate. So what do we do next? I don't think that information is the only policy lever. So we shouldn't do the analog of graphic warnings to scare people into taking shots. And this would be a misuse of informational policies. Other incentives, whether it's reductions in the cost of getting a vaccine, promoting vaccine passports, or requirements to be vaccinated, which is what over 100 universities have already done 
will bolster uh, vaccination rates. Now, my final comments is for vaccines, masks, and other precautions, public health doesn't always dominate personal freedom and the ability to inflict harm on others. But if there are huge health costs, public health concerns should dominate. And that's it. Well, thank you so much. There were three great presentations. I'm going to abuse my position here as chair, Cass, to lead off with one kind of more direct question to you before I open it out, which is obviously this paper comes within, you know, a broader body of work that you've done on behavioral um, economics. And I just want to make clear to our kind of listeners and viewers that you yourself wouldn't describe yourself as a Hayekian behavioral economist, I don't think, having read your paper. So could you just describe to us how this fits in with, say, the libertarian paternalism framework that you outlined uh, in, in your book, Nudge, and kind of how this f fits into the broader kind of canon of your work? I think you need to unmute. Um, that was uh, a mischievous effort to show bounded rationality in practice where I forgot to unmute, which showed limited attention and unrealistic optimism. So see, um, actually, it, it wasn't an intentional demonstration of bounded rationality, but it was a demonstration of bounded rationality. So the libertarian paternalism idea, consistent with what Kip said for sure, is preserve freedom of choice, but steer people's decisions in directions that make their lives go better as judged by themselves. That's the basic idea. A GPS device is um, uh, uh, pr is a libertarian paternalism. It allows people to program their own preferred destination. It doesn't choose the destination. And it allows people to opt out if they want a different route. If they think that another route is more familiar or prettier or something, they can go their own way. So you can think of information disclosure as a nudge that's libertarian paternalism. And Professor Rizzo is correct to say you could define nudges such that they don't include informational interventions. And it's surely true to say that informational interventions go back to the Garden of Eden, and that was long before behavioral economics actually became a field. But standardly, informational interventions are, um, are nudges. Um, a default rule is also a nudge, uh, a form of architecture that makes something easy, for example, uh, is a nudge. So you might reduce administrative burdens or paperwork to encourage people to make certain choices. Uh, warnings, graphic or otherwise, can be nudges. They might be good or bad, but they're nudges. And th these are uh, interventions whose characteristics are uh, first, that they preserve freedom of choice, so they're emphatically libertarian. If they impose material costs of any significance, they aren't nudges anymore. That they are paternalistic in the sense that the person who devises them is trying to steer people in a certain direction, like a default rule that automatically enrolls you in a savings plan. That is paternalistic. Um, but it also um, makes as the criterion whether the choosers are better off by their own lights, not by the planner's lights. Okay, you could have a form of libertarian paternalism, which isn't Hayekian. It could be one that makes the planner's expert judgments about what's best for people decisive. So, so a libertarian paternalist could say, look, people really need to be saving. Otherwise, they're going to be poor when they're old, and that's really bad. That wouldn't be Hayekian. That would be prizing the expert's own assessment. So what makes this paper different, really fundamentally different from anything I've done before, is that it takes on board uh, fully Hayek's concerns about the epistemic deficits of the choosers and says, if we take that on board, what questions do we ask if we are private or public institutions in trying to decide what to do? And I'll give you, I think, a, 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 a two uncontentious examples, I hope. One is there's a plan the U.S. Department of Agriculture has by which poor children can be automatically enrolled in a program by which they get free lunches and breakfasts. Should there be automatic enrollment in that? Well, if we knew that informed active choosers say, yes, that's a good deal, then on Hayekian grounds, that program the automatic enrollment would start to look better than if we knew that informed active choosers said, heck no, I don't want to be in your stupid program. 
So the high key and criterion would be helpful in deciding whether an automatic enrollment is a good idea. Second case, there's some data suggesting that in some contexts, people make choices with respect to healthcare. Certain parts of the population make choices that are impossible to defend in the sense that they're dominated. I'll give you one example where choosers, it's going to be stylized, choosers choose a plan that's identical to another plan, except it's more expensive. Now, you need to be really fancy about explanations why you should choose a more expensive plan that's identical to the plan that you reject, but people roughly do. And now in that context, we know informed choosers just don't do that. And that would give us some purchase about, in, so to speak, in what direction to nudge or what kind of structure to create or potentially what sort of default rule to use. So the contribution of this paper, if there is one, I tried, is to suggest that on Hayekian grounds, we are looking squarely in the eye of choosers who are not uninformed about relevant facts and who are in this, in this system in such a way that they aren't behaviorally biased. They have authority. Now, Kip's view is that is, is what the car market looks like that people are making choices for cars that they like, considering the fact that fuel economy is only one factor. If that's true, he's completely right, and he might be true. There's a research agenda, as he emphasized, to figure out what are the facts on the ground. That's a Hayekian research agenda. And following on from that, I'm going to try and uh, maybe awkwardly here, merge three different questions into, into one as a kind of follow up for that. Um, so the first question is, how do you identify the unbiased choosers? And uh, Clint then follows up by by saying, you know, he appreciates your explanation of, um, of uh, uh, what does he say here? Sorry, I've lost it. He, he kind of follows on from that. How do you identify the unbiased choosers by saying, you know, what is it to keep authorities from confusing the question and I think this is a fear many libertarians would have and many Hayekians. What is to keep authorities from confusing the question, how would you follow your goals and values if you were informed and thinking clearly with what your goals and values should be if you were informed and thinking clearly? And the example that I'm going to kind of bring into this, which um, uh, another question I cites further down is, they say, Professor Viscusi, uh, he believes you once found that some people tended to dramatically overestimate the danger of smoking rather than underestimating it. So what would be the implications in that sort of situation from a Hayekian, Hayekian perspective in terms of the provision of, of information when, you know, that's an issue smoking where we've had quite a paternal, countries around the world have a very, very paternalistic agendas right now rather than, um, you know, in, implicitly trying to get people to fulfill their preferences. So perhaps I could start with uh, Professor Sunstein, then move to Professor Viscusi. <laughs> and sorry if that was a ramble. I'm trying to kind of merge questions together here. Okay, well, it's an empirical question wh whether you can identify the high bias choosers. Let's suppose you provide people with information about something and then they all start deciding that this is the way to go. Or let's suppose you give them clarity about the future effects of a choice, and then they decide, well, this is the way to go. You need evidence to demonstrate a behavioral fi find bias. And Mario is completely right to say you don't just take a laboratory finding and then say, hooray, there's a bias. Now we have a policy initiative. You should look at what actually people are doing once they're provided with information, once they're given clarity about the facts. There's a paper out just, I think, this week uh, involving a nudge for an informational nudge involving payday lending in Texas, an informational nudge that's specifically designed to overcome present bias and unrealistic optimism. So I think Kip would like it because it's agency promoting. I think the behavioral types would also like it because it's behaviorally informed. In fact, it grows out of behavioral research and boom, the level of payday uh, loan taking in Texas went down very significantly. Now that's powerfully suggestive that there a behavioral bias was at work because once people get relevant information that's clear and salient, they think that's a stupid loan. Before they got that information, they thought, well, maybe I'll take out that. It turns out stupid loan. Professor Viscusi. Well, I'm going to 
turn, focused on the uh, cigarette topic that you raised. And, you know, a lot of people view this as, as people who have failed and they're, they're smoking cigarettes, even though they're clearly a, a very dangerous commodity. But smoking has been, and the perception of risk of smoking has been pretty thoroughly analyzed. I found that people substantially overestimate the lung cancer risk of smoking. They overestimate the mortality risk of smoking. They overestimate the life expectancy loss due to smoking. If you look at the financial costs inflicted on the rest of society, on balance, smokers save society money rather than increasing the external cost to the rest of society. And I view smoking as, uh, from a behavioral standpoint should be viewed as a behavioral success story. So over the past 50 or 60 years, we've provided information to the public through the media, We've provided information to the public through the annual Surgeon General's report, through on-product warnings. Behavioral people basically should be celebrating this as an example that informational policies can work. And as given this, you don't need to continue to discourage smoking above and beyond providing information, which we've already done. So from my standpoint, you don't need cigarette taxes to discourage smoking because people already overestimate the risk. You don't need cigarette taxes for society to recoup money because their premature death from smoking frees up social security and nursing home costs and other uh, financial costs for the rest of society. So on balance, you know, cigarettes are a well-performing commodity, at least in terms of the, how things stand now, given that we've already provided information to the consumer. I'd like to make uh, two comments, if I might. Uh, I'll leave the smoking to, to, to Kip, because as far as I'm concerned, he's the expert on smoking. And uh, much of what I know about the issue is derived from his work. Um, I want to talk about informational nudges, the concept of the informational nudge. I think there's a real problem here, because first of all, my view is there's no such thing as a nudge unless there's a bias. Otherwise, it's something else. In this case, informational nudges have to mean something more than providing information. It has to be in the context of there being a certain type of bias, uh, whatever the bias might be. Now, the problem is that when you talk about informational nudges, it's sometimes not clear whether it's the old-fashioned neoclassical information that's doing the trick or, or it's some sort, sort of overcoming of a behavioral bias that's doing the trick. So if you provide information to people in some clear way and they change their behavior, I don't see that that decides it between behavioral economics and, as I say, old-fashioned neoclassical uh, economics. Um, I also like to say something about this notion of epistemically favorable conditions. Sounds good, except for the fact that there are so many biases. And one of the problems with behavioral economics, and I can understand why this is the case, is that typically one bias at a time is investigated. Perhaps in some more elaborate stories, uh, two biases. But if there are, in fact, as many biases as we have least discovered from uh, laboratory experiments, I'm not clear, it's not clear to me that we can easily identify people making decisions under epistemically favorable conditions, because that would have to be under conditions where all the relevant biases with respect to that decision have been eliminated. And if we only bother to investigate one or two biases at a time, uh, I don't know that we are finding epistemically favorable conditions under which we can say, this is what people's real preferences or true preferences are. So I've got a question uh, following on from that. It's from an anonymous uh, user on one of our platforms. He says, what is the basis for assuming that well-informed active choosers um, have the same kind of underlying goals, preferences as less informed, less active choosers? Doesn't the very fact that they choose to be better informed and more active suggests that they may not or that they perceive the you know costs and benefits of, of becoming more informed very differently from others. 
Okay, it's a great question. So, uh, so there's no assumption that the informed unbiased choosers are the same as the uninformed biased choosers. Uh, it's an empirical question whether they are. So you could devise an experiment, it could be even be a natural experiment, not in the lab, in which you tell people a lot of stuff about fuel economy so as to overcome, let's say, a potential absence of information, and so as to overcome potential present bias. And then you see, do people start buying more fuel efficient cars? Actually, Hunt Alcott and co-author have done that experiment, and they don't. Uh, whether you believe the result or not, it is a Hayekian inquiry, and it's a very agile way of testing the question, what people do under for circumstances in which behavioral biases are directly addressed and which informational de deficits are uh, overcome. And you could do this with any number of things under the sun. Whether people who are making active choices uh, choose to enroll in a program for which their children get free meals isn't really the hardest question in the world. They do. And it's pretty clear that a randomized experiment would suggest that active choosers choose free, free stuff and inactive choosers don't. And the reason is not because they don't want the stuff, but because they're busy or inattentive or something. So the, the question points in exactly the right direction, but it's not an argument against the inquiry. It's an argument in favor of doing the inquiry in a way that's attuned uh, to, the, to the excellent point the question raises. I want to shift gears slightly and ask this question to Professor Rizzo. Um, you mentioned self-regulation. This is a question from Eric Rasmussen. Um, but if we, you know, what evidence is there? If we take care of people with regulation or other nudges or interventions, um, is there kind of evidence that they do stop thinking and stop self-regulating? Is there a kind of a public-private crowd out here? What evidence do we have for this? Are there any particularly pertinent examples that come to mind? Well, there is a, a, a literature on, an, on the substitutability of external and internal regulation. Uh, by external, I mean regulation uh, that emanates from either uh, prohibitions or uh, nudges or that kind of thing, just some, something from the outside versus regulation which is self-generated and self uh, self-determined uh, that they are that they are substitutes and that when uh, there have been experiments in which people uh, have uh, been uh, subject to external regulation that their ability to internally regulate uh, is reduced over the long run um, now uh, there isn't a great amount of evidence on this issue, but there is some evidence on the on the issue. Hiring question, and it shows you how much there is to learn. So offhand, there are three possibilities. Let's suppose there's some sugar tax or something or meal construction such that people aren't eating as much of a certain thing. It might be that there'll be countervailing behavior so as to negate the health benefit of the intervention. That's completely possible. It might be that the intervention will be unmet by countervailing behavior. So such benefits and costs as it produces are uh, unaffected. And it might be that the behavior has a spillover so that people who are eating, let's say, more salad and less cheeseburgers start thinking salad is actually more delicious than I thought or less horrible than I thought, or they might be thinking uh, I'm losing weight and I'm feeling better. So all three of these are testable hypotheses and we really ought to test them. Mario is completely right that the evidence that is outstanding is a sliver of what we need to know, but there are papers supportive of each of the three hypotheses just described, and we need to know their boundary conditions. Yeah, just thinking about it, I mean, there might be other instances, might there not, where behavioral consumers who are kind of behavioral in one setting actually respond to the interventions in a kind of behaviorally biased way as well. I'm thinking, you know, I'm thinking of an extreme example, you might think you need kind of uh, strict drug laws on the basis that people underestimate the risk of getting addicted to hard drugs. But then the prohibition itself um, leads to a situation in which the dosages and the contents of the products are more uncertain and uh, 
and that might affect the same behavioral group of um, uh, of consumers in an adverse way. So there's all sorts of interesting things that you could test empirically on these on these questions. Um, I'm going to go to another question from uh, the audience. Um, this is this is one for, for, for you, Professor Sunstein. Does the spread of the awareness of behavioral economic analysis, in your view, erode its pre its prevalence in practice? Have we seen, as your work has gone mainstream, have we seen um, that it's helped ameliorate some of the biases that, that you've identified? Um, uh, I can't claim any success on that count. Um, <laughs> And I, I, I guess I guess following up from that, sorry to, to, to jump in, I guess what the question is getting at is, as this has gone mainstream, have we seen kind of more private um, efforts at coming to solutions to solve biases? So, you know, you, you think on dieting, for example, there's all sorts of apps and nudges and things that people are using. OK, that, that's excellent. So what I was thinking was, uh, are those of us who have read behavioral economics and, and written about it, are we immune from behavioral biases? No, um, but if the question has grow, growing knowledge of behavioral economics and behavioral science given rise to uh, private creativity that's ad addressing behavioral biases, absolutely. And those who are nervous about government might be less nervous about this. So there are apps that address self-control problems, that address present bias, that address availability bias. There's, there are a lot of efforts to try to counteract uh, I wouldn't call it irrationality, I'd call it bounded rationality, and uh, you know, let a thousand flowers bloom and let's see what works. That's, that's a great answer. Um, this is to Professor Rizzo. How does Hayekian, um, how does Hayekian thought view the effect of purposeful misinformation uh, directed towards consumers? Well, I, I think in this case, uh, Hayek's thought would be very uh, similar to what the legal uh, order is. I, th I mean, it depends on what you mean. Uh, certainly, uh, some of this comes under fraud, right? Purposeful uh, telling people that the refrigerator does X, Y, and Z, and it doesn't do X, Y, and Z. So we've got the law of fraud, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I'm not sure what is really meant by this. Is there something more subtle uh, that's meant? Uh, but, if it's, but if it's ordinary misinformation deliberately uh, provided, uh, then it's fraud, I guess. And I think Hayek would accept that. Got another um, kind of great question here. Um, this person does emphasize, Cass and, and uh, Professor Sunstein, you mentioned this, um, the issue of kind of tacit knowledge that's very, very difficult for the planner to collect. Um, given that, what do you perceive as the kind of most difficult and thorny um, public policy challenges, issues of bias that um, it'd be very, very difficult to conduct experiments to collect the information to try to answer your five questions. Well, let's talk about a really hard one, which is sugar taxes. And insofar as sugar taxes are designed to reduce internalities, meaning the harms that people inflict on their future selves, is this a matter of people just really like, as I do, uh, donuts in the morning that have plenty of sugar? or is that they're uh, insufficiently attentive to harms to their future selves. That's very hard to test for. Hunt Alcott has a paper which tries to calculate the internality as well as the externality from excess sugar consumption and concludes that it's positive. He does something very much in the spirit of what my paper does, that is, which isn't a coincidence because he's a co-author, I've learned from him, but he tries to figure out what do inform people do with respect to sugar consumption insofar as they're not evidently different from people who are uninformed. Um, and he tries to use that, but he himself is very cautious about uh, the number he comes up with or and even the methodology. So that's a hard one. I think both Mario and Kip are correct to suggest that the energy efficiency and fuel economy issues 
are very, very challenging. We can talk about people uh, not buying products from which they'd make money over the life of, let's say, the refrigerator or the microwave oven, but maybe they don't like the energy efficient microwave oven because they don't like how it looks, they don't like its size, and, and this is very hard to get clarity on. Uh, Professor Viscusi was going to come in on my um, screen. He's frozen um, at the moment. So we'll move on to the next question, hopefully. Uh, we'll, we'll, actually, we'll go to Professor Rizzo because you've done, you know, you, you spoke about the examples of some of these syntaxes as well. So thoughts on this? I mean, th there are lots of issues. Uh, and I sometimes when I, when I talk to my students about this, uh, I talk about, you know, well, if a, if a harm is potentially... 20, 30, 40 years out because of eating junk food, et cetera. Uh, what exactly is the harm 20 or 30, 40 years from now? What is the state of medical technology 20, 30, 40 years from now? People in 1960 who were obese were in far worse health than people who were obese today. So, you know, it's very difficult uh, to, uh, to say to a young person that they're not adequately taking into account the future costs of their uh, behavior when none of us really know what the future costs of their behavior are. So uh, I think that's an important thing to, uh, to keep in mind. That's great. We've got time for just, I think, two more quick questions. Um, the first one, how can an experiment like the ones described do justice to Hayek's emphasis on local knowledge of time and place? An experimental setting puts test subjects in a realm where their actual local knowledge is irrelevant in favor of using just the info, for example, on fuel efficiency that the tester provides. So I guess this question is getting at the difficulty of, you know, really trying to ascertain people's preferences under, you know, unbiased conditions. Well, I don't know if it's so hard. Um, suppose people are going to an appliance store and they're trying to choose what refrigerator to buy. And let's suppose case one, there's something about the energy efficiency of the refrigerators that's on the refrigerators with money attached, meaning they know how much they would spend and save. And then they can use their local knowledge in a way that's informed by something they probably care about, which is money and we can learn what they buy. And that could be randomized. Or it could be that we have an experiment with respect to credit cards, where we make not only uh, informed, uh, we don't only provide the information, we get really salient what the late fees are and what the overuse fees are. Or let's suppose we randomize such that people who are about to incur late fees get a text message saying you're about to incur a late fee. Now, if you don't pay up, now it might be that people who are um, reminded and therefore their attention is uh, triggered, not in the kind of or current, <laughs> not triggered in the sense that, oh my God, but triggered in the sense that, oh my gosh, that those people, maybe they're paying the late fee, maybe they're not, and uh, they can use their local knowledge. They might think the late fee is not so bad. I kind of need the money for my kid right now. So we can do this. This is not, the, the, we can find cases where it'd be really hard, but there are a lot where it's not so hard. Okay, I'd like to make a comment, but it's a more general comment than on this, uh, because I see our time is, is coming to an end. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk just briefly about this concept of uh, explainations. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a very hard word uh, to say quickly. Uh, but I want to say that there's another aspect of, of, of the shuns that we might think about. And that is something that uh, Glenn Whitman and I are calling assumations. Uh, you know, a lot of the uh, points that Cass makes are, are perfectly valid in the sense that more empirical research may show different things uh, favorable or perhaps unfavorable to behavioral public policy. But on the other hand, I think we have to be careful about uh, what 
kinds of assumptions we make when we're talking about the plausibility of behavioral public policy, simply because it is possible that some of these problems could be uh, uh, eliminated or reduced doesn't mean that it's likely or actually will happen. So, you know, while I far be it from me to say that people shouldn't do research in a particular area, uh, nevertheless, I'm, 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 I am saying that I think it's important to say what has what is known now and whether or not behavioral economics is really ready for policy prescriptions. It may be that maybe someday it might be, uh, but perhaps it's premature. Um, we are running out of time, but I'm conscious of the fact that Professor Viscusi just got back with us, but he seems to have frozen again on my screen. Uh, so we'll probably have to end the event there. Um, to all of our speakers, Professor Sunstein, Professor Rizzo, Professor Thank Viscusi, that was a fantastic event. Um, there are so many questions that I, I wasn't able to get to this evening. Um, that was one of the, the biggest viewerships that certainly uh, we've had during my time at Cato. And we really appreciate all of your comments. Keen to keep this conversation um, going. It's a very important topic and an evolving topic. And uh, hopefully we'll have more events uh, on behavioral economics, its limitations, and uh, the potential downsides in terms of its application to public policy in the future. Um, this video, if you've enjoyed it, will be available for your viewing from the on the Cato website pretty soon. I think probably from uh, tomorrow. Um, thank you for being with us. Um, I know that we, we've kind of run late into your evening, but we really do appreciate uh, you, you viewing and implicitly kind of supporting Cato's work by giving us your eyes. We know that we're competing with lots of other uh, forms of entertainment for your attention. So thanks for being with us. Uh, have a great evening.